episode of The Agronomist is brought to you by the Edible Bean School, Canola Master, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Agronomists. My feed is super laggy, and we're not sure why, uh, but we'll get working on that. Yes, uh, another episode. Here we are. Thank you to our show sponsors. And a quick reminder, we did have a little hiccup today um, sending out the alert for today's program. So I want you to head to realagriculture.com slash agronomists two things. That's where you let us know you watch the program and you get your CEUs. That's very important, obviously. But the second part is there's actually a little button there that says sign up for the agronomist email. And that email list is just to remind you about the show or to let you know about CEU collection opportunities, etc. So if CEUs are something you need and, and collect, or if you just love the show and don't ever want to forget about it on a Monday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern live here across social media feeds, uh, you can sign up for that email blast and it will, um, it will let you know just a few hours before we go live. So that's the reminder. Thank you to everyone who made it anyway, uh, who didn't get that little nudge. John, welcome back. Haven't seen you for a while. Hope everything's okay. And I do see that Peter Johnson is here, which is interesting because a little birdie told me he is headed to Winnipeg early in the morning. Uh, because there is a Manitoba agronomy conference happening this week in Manitoba. Um, and of course, hello to Kevin as well out there in BC. All right, so tonight's episode, super exciting. We're going to talk about edible beans, dry beans, whatever you want to call them. Um, and so joining me for tonight's discussion, we'll bring them on in, is Dennis Lang with Manitoba Agriculture and Paul Cornwell with Hansel Co-op. Welcome here, Dennis. Hello, Paul. Good evening. Hey, good evening. Okay. All right. So we're going to try our best here to get this rolling. Uh, I feel like maybe the lag has, has sped up a little bit. We'll see. Um, so I realized um, in planning for tonight's episode, because next week we're actually going to do our sort of end of year wrap up, which feels atrociously early, but it is December 12th. So I want to start with, as we talk about edible beans, the kind of year that it was. And Paul, I'll start with you here in Ontario. Um, how would you say for the edible bean crop, what kind of year did we have here in Ontario? Um, a, a pretty good year, most mostly. Um, like planting was um, was pretty good. It was dry through the summer. Um, we got some rains in August that really brought the crop home. So, you know, soybeans seemed to come a little bit short maybe in some ways, but uh, the dry bean, the edible bean crop uh, really brought it home for a lot of growers. So pretty pretty solid yields well above average i would say and uh, maybe not quite as good as manitoba um but uh dennis i'm sure has some comments about that <laughs> yes dennis now is your time to shine yes. and yes nice nice shirt yes, it, it, yes. let's let's just thank you it, it, let's just say it's been a very interesting year because um come uh, may 1st there was snow on the ground here so everybody's getting a little bit nervous about you know what the year is going to be like for all crops actually um and the dry beans went in the, the your typical growers uh, continued what they're what they were originally going to plant um and i guess we did see fewer acres this year but i think that probably the biggest thing that we saw this year is we probably had i would say overall in most dry bean areas the most perfect um, moisture and, and that combined with heat at the right time and not getting heat at the wrong time um the growers did very well this year um, we're probably going to break our provincial record this year. And I'm thinking we're going to be somewhere around 2,400 pounds ish. Um, and all classes in most dry bean areas, growers are very happy. I'm being a little cautious here because I don't want to say the big three number because I know there were some threes out right. there. Um, right. But uh, uh, we did have some growers that did have some challenges. There were some very wet areas, but I think overall we're, we're, we're doing pretty good. So. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, 
Jason Vogt uh, did say that he owes you a presentation for the Manitoba Agronomy Conference. So, Jason, this is your reminder to go and get that done as soon as the show is over. Um, but yes, so, I mean, this is one of the interesting stories of this year for sure in Manitoba. Um, but I think also in Ontario is that there was maybe some surprise both to uh, maybe in Manitoba to the good um, and uh, maybe in Ontario uh, somewhat disappointing at times for things that looked over. Okay, but then we did have some very dry areas that, um, you know, there weren't very high hopes. Um, I will get back to that in just a moment because I'm lagging again. But John, I will let you know that I have ordered Starlink. I'm just waiting for Elon to come and install it um, or actually tell me that I can actually get Starlink. So there you go. Um, okay, so tonight's episode is probably going to focus quite a bit on quality, of course. Paul, let's start with you. Why, when, unlike maybe some other crops, do we focus so much on the quality of dry beans, of edible beans? Yeah, like quality is, is king in the bean world. It's one of the few crops we eat as they are, right? So like if you bring up my uh, picture, Jay, of um, anthracnose cooked beans, that's a good place to start. I hope everybody's had their dinner already. It's not pretty, guys. <laughs> You know, so no. we, we've been super fortunate over the last, like, we probably haven't had a bad case of anthracnose in Ontario since 2011. I think Dennis is even longer than that. But anthracnose is a big evil in the beans, right? So this is a very, very low percentage of anthracnose in a bean sample. The sample has been cooked, obviously. Um, but it just, it's it's like it's it's magnified, you know, it's just amplified right up there. And it's just like... Nobody wants to eat that, right? It's just garbage. So even a low percentage um, can can get through the electric eyes. Like once we're above that two, three percent, it's very hard to get it all out. And it can just decimate your crop. And that's even if you harvest the field. Um, but even low, low levels are, are bad on the quality bean side. So we eat beans as a yeah. whole. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, so Kevin, who's from the Fraser Valley in BC, says, okay, wait a minute. If we're talking, so let's back up one step. And you're right, Kevin, I should have done this to start with. When we talk edible and dry beans, what beans are we talking about and what are they used for? And Paul, this is a great spot for you because, yeah. of course, you, you market these things as the yeah. ingredients. So what, what beans are we talking about? So um, everywhere else in the world, but... Um, Ontario calls these beans that we're looking at navy beans. Um, so these are your baked beans. These are your beans that England, you know, most of them are exported to the UK where they're eating beans breakfast, noon and, and dinner and tea and all the other meals. Um, they eat an incredible amount of beans. So that's your navy beans. Here in Ontario, we call them white beans or white pea beans. From there, you branch into um, other market classes, we'll call them like your black beans, your pinto beans. Um, then you get into um, some of the larger classes of beans by seed size, your cranberry beans or in the grocery store, you'll see them as Romano beans and kidney beans, your dark reds, your light reds, your whites. Like there's crazy varieties, uh, market classes um, of all the different beans out there. So you know, basically they're the Phaseolus vulgaris, the species, um, they're all common beans, dry beans, edible beans. Um, they go by lots of different names. So, so Dennis, I, I sort of look at dry beans are like the pulse crop of Ontario in that, you know, you've got red and green lentils, you've got chickpeas, you've got fabas, you got, you know, whatever. Um, so different kinds and they all have their pros and cons. They all have their specific sort of what they like and they don't. But just quickly, Dennis, what are the most common in Manitoba? Because I, I think there are a few that Ontario grows that Manitoba doesn't grow as many. Oh, yeah. Azuki beans. Yes. Yeah. Azuki like beans. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. We have so for, for, for Manitoba, um, we kind of bounce around between navies and pintos being number one. Uh, this last year, okay. pintos were, were number one in Manitoba, navies number two. Kind of bounce around between those ones. Blacks, black beans would be number three. Um, we also grow light and dark red kidneys. Um, there's a few white kidneys just on a you know, contract basis. Um, some uh, cranberry beans, uh, some pink beans, some great northerns. So we have quite a mix of different uh, bean types in Manitoba. Uh, pintos, though, are one of the more major types uh, in the last few years, but the years that we had issues with anthracnose, it was in the navy beans. Um, we had varieties that were highly susceptible. We had 
growers that had been using Benrun seed of those susceptible lines and putting beans on beans for multiple years. Um, and uh, we had to make some big changes in, in the province and really focus on what varieties we needed to move forward with to control. And that was back in the early 2000s. And probably, I think the last year we've seen any anthracnose uh, was probably back in 2012 um, in some pintles. But before that, you'd have to go back to 2005. Um, uh, in those, that was a really bad year uh, for us as well for anthracnose, but 2000 was the one that really hit us hard. So, mm -hmm. so Paul, is it is it similar in Ontario that certain types or classes of beans are far more susceptible? Yeah, certainly. Some of it, like um, a lot of the big beans, are resistant to our predominant race, which is race 73. Um, the breeding programs have been doing a great job of bringing in race 73 resistance into the navy beans and black beans now too. So we are getting some resistance, but, you know, anthracnose, like many diseases, can quickly change races on you. So as soon as you let your guard down for a moment, a year or two, um, it can come right back roaring with a new race pretty quickly. So we use lots of little tricks. We have many tricks in our toolbox now to minimize anthracnose. Mm -hmm. um, Western grown seed, like west of the continental divide, um, is a huge major one. Um, that's why a lot of the seed is imported, um, particularly from Idaho, but also Wyoming and Washington are pretty anthracnose free as well. And then uh, using in fu fungicides, uh, most of the strobilurins are really good on anthracnose control. And the seed treatment to kind of finish it all off to, to, or to get the beans started um, helps out a lot too. So does, does Dennis mentioned beans on beans? Dennis is, I mean, crop rotation is so important for some diseases, but less important for others is anthracnose one we can manage partway with rotation or not? Um, I guess if you look at what happened in Manitoba, when we did have those issues with anthracnose, um, race 73, again, more, one of the more predominant uh, resistant races that we have, Envoy at the time was the one that had it. Um, so Envoy Acres continued for almost 20 years. And with that, I guess the one change that we've seen in Manitoba is in 20, 2002, we had 312,000 acres, just huge amounts of acres of dry beans in Manitoba. They were growing pretty much anywhere. Um, but then we had soybeans move in. And the dry bean acres And now what we're seeing in the last five to 10 years is the dry bean growers are saving their best ground for their dry beans. So they're watching the rotation. They're trying to get that one and three, one and four year rotation. Um, the number one Navy planted in Manitoba is uh, T9905. Um, unfortunately, it does not have any resistance to race 73. Um, but I think following a good rotation, getting that Western seed has really helped, I think, as well. But I think just following the rotation, making sure you don't have that bean snow bean rotation, that was a real concern when a disease really first hit. Um, we had some varieties that are no longer available um, and even certified lines at that time were getting hit. So we've kind of, you know, I, I always get a little nervous about that, relying on, you know, um, you know, a variety that does not have uh, resistance to race 73. But if we're managing it through rotation and, and, uh, and not getting it too tight in there and, and trying to go with good seed all the time. I think that that makes a, a world of difference. So, okay, we will talk about Azuki maybe a few times tonight, but um, Paul, what would be a typical rotation for dry bean growers in Ontario? Um, typically, it would be a three-year rotation. So it, yeah. it would be corn followed by dry beans, followed by winter wheat, and then back to corn. So, do, so where do soybeans fit? Do they never share the same ground then? Is that I one of the, well, I shouldn't no, say never, I hope you're not. right. Yeah. Never say yeah, never, but, but is that like a key factor for dry bean growers is that you're not growing soybeans and, and dry beans on the same acres? Not at the, well, no, I, I wouldn't say that's a thing at all. I would just say, you know, kind of Dennis alluded to it a little bit. You're going to save your absolute best ground for mm -hmm. dry edible beans. Soybeans can, you know, they can handle the clays of Lambton County and Niagara, that good old Brookston clay. Don't ever put your white beans there, right? Like um, they'll never come out of the ground. So you, you want that that good mellow dirt. Um, ideally, after winter wheat would be better for dry beans. You'll get a lot better uh, yields and growth and, and everything else. But uh, all, honestly, it all comes after corn. Um, you, you certainly grow soybeans in that 
background and and I would even probably lots of people would argue with me that they would do it every what six years then so they'd be corn soybeans wheat corn dry beans wheat yeah um to kind of lengthen out that but obviously the pests with soybeans and and edible beans are pretty much the same so there's a lot of uh yeah a lot of commonality there dennis's growers have to also deal with sunflowers in rotation (laughs) and canola so there's all sorts of things that love to eat all (laughs) yeah The one, the one, the, the one comment I'd like to make though about soybeans in Manitoba, and we've, I've seen this personally in, in my days of, in private industry and also with government as well. Um, number one, you got to keep your best ground for dry beans. That's probably the first thing to do. But if you have a piece of ground that has had soybeans two years prior and you only have one year between, um, let's say you have soybeans in year one, wheat in year two, and decide to put dry beans in year three, be prepared to have some volunteer soybeans in that sample. Mm-hmm. And that is consider food allergy in the dry bean business. Um, I've had growers get loads rejected because of it. So you got to stretch that out if you want to put soybeans in that same rotation. I wouldn't recommend it. I Again, keeping your best ground for dry beans and put your soybeans on ground that can uh, maybe is a little bit more prone to uh, to flooding. But, uh, you know, that issue with volunteers uh, in the sample, yeah, it can be it can be bad. I've seen it. I've seen it up to 10%. Um, um, in the final sample of a dry bean sample and the grower just had no options with it because you can't really clean those out really easily so Mm -hmm. um we are going to talk about sorting seed because i do love color sorters so we will we'll talk about a little later and dr dave hooker has entered the chat and has a great question that we are absolutely going to talk about but not quite yet because we are going to talk about soybean cyst nematode but uh producer jay i think we're going to go to clip two first which is um deciding on when to roll um, and field selection, because I think that just fits a little bit better with what we're talking about now. Uh, so we'll go to clip two. This is with Josh Moffat. Now, if you take a look at, at my bean that I have in the ground here, this bean, Azuki bean, was put in at a, at a little bit deeper of a depth, a little over two inches, but that was just to make sure that we were getting in the soil moisture. They were a little bit more later planted because we waited for a rain once again, just so we didn't have that as a limiting factor. The Zuki bean was a great variety to try this with because it leaves its cotyledons in the ground. The seed here stays in the ground and doesn't come out like a kidney bean or a soybean or something like that. So in this case, it had less, it needed to push up through and it was able to come through the ground just perfectly. Now, some growers will ask, should we roll this field? Azuki beans are usually direct harvested, so usually having as flat and smooth and level field as possible is a good idea. So in this case, we might wait till we see one or two trifoliates before we go in and roll this with a roller. This will make sure that everything is level, good for the direct harvesting combine, and also maybe conserve a little bit of soil moisture in the end. We're here in field number three, and not all things always go perfect, and we can learn a lot from that. So in this kidney field here, we had two inches of rain directly after planting. This makes it very difficult for these kidney beans to emerge as they have large cotyledons to push out the ground. It's almost like pulling elephant ears out of the ground. So here, we're watching the emergence come. We can see some big soil crusting. There's a little bit of big boulders coming through, and we're watching these kidney beans leaf out underground a little bit. So by leafing out underground, they're getting stuck. The cotyledons are almost getting stuck a little bit as they're coming. Now, this field will likely be fine in the end. Um, It looks like we have enough population coming as you look through the row. It's just gonna be a little bit uneven and not necessarily perfect like our last kidney field that we looked at. Again, we're aiming for that population to be up above that 60,000 plants mark. And this one, will likely be able to make it to that. Some growers will ask, what can we do? Well, in this case, it's not very crusted. It's not that heavy. They're not that covered in the ground. So you can just leave it in this case and they will come. In a really bad situation where the soil is very crusted, we can bring the rotary hoe into action here. But the best method of all is to not race a rain. We're going to wrap things up with an example of where everything went right. This is a white bean field here and the grower waited for a rain, 
planted in that perfect timing of the first week of June, has an excellent population, good fertility, and good tillage method here. As you can see, our population is about that 100,000 mark with the white beans here, and we have excellent emergence. Almost every plant came up at the same time and is sitting at the same stage. This episode of The Agronomist is sponsored by Adama Canada, Canola Master, and the Edible Bean School. The Edible Bean School on realagriculture.com is an agronomy and issues video series that allows growers to learn on their own time at their own pace. From planning and seeding to fertility and nutrient management decisions to harvesting and storage, the Edible Bean School tackles every facet of the growing season in an engaging and informative format. Sponsored by Hansel Co-op, visit realagriculture.com slash edible bean school for more. It's such an inspiring read. Um, okay, so lots to cover there and a few few great uh, comments coming in in the chat as well. So I really appreciate it. Um, so the rolling question always comes up. It comes up with soybeans, but it comes up with dry beans as well. So Paul, maybe I'll start with you. The rolling question, it feels like it's more common in the West. Maybe that's just my perception. So is it just a field by field question or how do we tackle the rolling question in Ontario? I would think, well, wherever there's stones, you should be rolling. So that's, that's going <laughs> to, I'm going to say that one. So most operations, if, if they have a lot of stones and they're used to rolling soybeans, absolutely, they're going to be rolling your edible beans. Um, it's pretty critical for any of the direct harvested beans to, to get them rolled. And timing wise, I would say most of the timing is all similar to, you know, once that second, third trifoliate heat of the day, when they're all kind of limp and hanging there, go out there and smash them down and watch them bounce right back up again. That's kind of the, the rule of thumb. Okay. So now Pete, uh, Peter Johnson, you may have heard of him. What percent of growers roll edibles <laughs> after emergence? <laughs> oh, I would, it would be hard to guess that one. Like, you know, Oxford County, where there's not a lot of stones and they grow a lot of edible beans, they're probably not rolling as much. But in Huron County, I would say most of the ground gets rolled. Mm. Okay. And, and yeah. some before planting, like some some will, you know, cultivate, level the ground out, roll them down flat, then plant through that where they're not picking up, kicking up stones with the planter. Um, certainly yeah. that's happening too. And I would say yeah, most of it gets rolled at one point or the other. Absolutely. Okay. All right, Dennis, similar question to you. This is definitely one of those uh, every year there are questions about do you roll, do you not? Stones, yes, are an issue. Uh, but but how do we tackle the rolling question uh, in Manitoba? Well, I guess for dry beans, what I tend to look at is is when I get calls from growers, the first question I ask them is, is um, are you rolling after planting or are you rolling um uh, like after, right after planting, or do you want to wait until the beans are up? Um, in some years, we're very, very dry here in spring after planting. And if you go roll right afterwards, you get, especially in that light soil, you get dust storms. And that's not good for anything. Um, so the growers that are patient and say, you know what, we're going to wait until the beans are up. Then we typically say, well, first trifoliate, you know, you want those beans up. You want to be 25 degrees Celsius. Um, you want to do a stand count. I think that's one thing that really gets uh, emitted by some growers is that they, they look at the temperature and it's like 25 degrees at 10 in the morning and they're going to go roll. Well, yeah, it's 25 degrees, but the plants haven't really warmed up yet. And they need, usually I say mid-afternoon, let those plants, um, you know, get nice and, and limp, but then do a stand count, you know, see what you're breaking. Because if you're only taking, you know, one or 2% and you have lots of plants, yeah. Yeah, they end up keep going. Um, the one little hesitation I give to growers is that you do have a bit of a window. So it's you can go at first trifoliate, but if your beans are at the unifoliate stage um, and they're all up and you have good temperature, go ahead and roll then. Um, because what ends up happening is if you, let's say, get to first trifoliate and all of a sudden now you get you know an inch of rain and it stays damp for a week, you can't roll when the ground is damp. And if you're rolling because of stones, you might miss that window. I've had that happen with growers. So you have to be, you have to really watch. It can be done and it can be done very successfully, 
but you know, keeping an eye on your plant stand, look at what's breaking off, um, keeping an eye on the weather, uh, both current and long-term uh, forecast, so you can make that decision. And then, you know, just check to see what uh, what kind of damage you're doing, and, and do it in the afternoon, not not, not for in the morning. So. Um, all right. So Dr. Dave says, can we talk tillage and cover crops too? Dave, we can talk about whatever we want. It just doesn't mean we're necessarily going to have the answers that you are looking for. But by all means, ask away. Um, I do, before we move on for the rolling thing, I, I do want to talk about cresting because, and Pete has sort of alluded to this in the comments as well. I think we're having a very successful show because we've got some spammers jumping in as well. Uh, but we'll just ignore them. But um, talking about cresting, and I love in that particular Edible Bean School video, you know, that talking about that that visualization of pulling those cotyledons, those elephant ears through the soil surface. Um, and I mean, a great visual of it. But we do need to understand how the bean type does emerge. And crusting is one of these very scary things. So, Paul, how do you sort of, how do you frame that decision making process of a, trying to avoid it, and B, what do we do if we are in danger of dealing with crusting? Yeah, the number one method is to avoid it. So don't plant before rain, right? Like, don't chase the rain. Don't try and get the beans in the ground before the rain. Typically, we're planting dry beans that last week of May, that first week of June, and, and you know we're going to get a one, two-inch thunder shower come through. And if you get hit, you're, you're replanting. Like, the most growers have grown soybeans and soybeans will put push through a crust edible beans you know and especially kidney beans the cotyledons are so big they literally look like elephant ears or pumpkin leaves coming up through the ground they they can't push so you're you're not going to bust through any crust whatsoever your population is lower so they don't have their friends in the road to kind of push that slab up together um, so you, you absolutely want to avoid crust completely. Um, you know, you're growing them in ground that isn't, isn't crust prone, like your better dirt isn't going to be so crust prone. You're not chasing the rain. You're not, um, and they'll come out of the ground in four or five days when the ground is warmed up that time of year. So, you know, your forecast should, should be a good indicator of when to plant. When you do have a crust, that's, uh, you know, I've been, you know, walking, edible beans fields for 25 years now it's when you do have to make that replant call it's your toughest call of the year the toughest call is call as an agronomist is is mm -hmm. uh doing a replant call because you just don't know what to do how many are going to push most of the time they don't push so you likely are going to replant it's you just mm -hmm. have to wait for the ground to be fit to replant again so then is are enough going to be there or not so Mm -hmm. Now, Peter is jumping the gun. So Peter, Simmer, we're going to talk about white mold. We have to talk about white mold. And I have pulled a clip about white mold, but we're going to talk about it a little bit later because first, I promised we would talk about soybean cyst nematode. So um, this is a concern, of course, So we were talking about having soybeans in rotation. Uh, depending on how we're going to manage that, we have to talk about volunteers. Sure. Um, but Dennis, you've got a slide um, looking at soybean cyst nematode instance in Manitoba or where we're finding it. So how much of a concern is this? Um, how do we manage the soybean cyst well, nematode question? Well, producer Jay, let's pull up. Can we pull up slide six first? Can we do that one for real fast? I bet you we can. Ta -da. Oh, there we go. Nope. Excellent. There. Excellent. Excellent. Look at that. that. Yep, that'll work. Yep. Um, so in Manitoba, this was uh, this particular field was the first time we were actually able to see the cysts on um, soybean roots. Um, in the past, we've been able to find it um, through Miro Tunis program. It's been doing lots of soil sampling. He's been able to find it in the soil um, through microscopic analysis, but we've never seen it up until this particular field. Um, now, the history of this field was one in four years with 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 soybeans. But there was also a year in there, um, this, this particular grower also had dry beans in the rotation as well. And dry beans uh, basically provide a carrier year. Uh, in Minnesota, um, a number of years ago, they actually had high enough populations in their dry bean kidney fields that uh, it actually affected the yield, the soybeans and nematodes. So I think, you know, it's something that dry bean growers need to be aware of if they're planting soybeans in, in similar rotations. 
um, uh, if we can pull up that last, uh, the last slide with the map, I just want to show you where it's predominant in Manitoba. And if you look right along the Canada-US border near the bottom, that's where there's a lot of dry beans grown um, in that uh, Ryland, um, um, you know, Stanley, uh, into Paladies, right along the border there, uh, Moncom. So Moncom and Ryland, um, they have found soybean system. So that field uh, that you see, that we saw earlier, was in the arm of Thompson. There, there's an edible bean area through there. Um, and we just had the perfect storm for it to show up in the soybeans that particular year. But the grower had to really look at their future rotations on that field and on all these fields to make sure that, you know they were going to have the best best uh, uh, foot uh, put its best foot forward in in how to manage that rotation and in, in his dry beans and soybeans so he can grow both crops. So he's really going to have to watch that. So right now we haven't seen it in dry bean fields yet in Manitoba. Uh, we've seen it in soybean fields, but we all know that it does provide a carrier year. So it's just something for dry bean growers to be aware of that to really watch your rotations and just uh, assume that if, uh, try not to have dry beans and soybeans in that same rotation if you can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Paul, is this, uh, is this really, I mean, soybean cyst nematode is a bigger issue, I would say in Ontario, of course. Um, so how do we manage that with the Ontario lens? Uh, it's certainly a little trickier, right? So I would say that, yes, um there's variety differences there's market class differences there's lots of work being done well lots is a little bit of a uh, it's not exactly lots there's some work being done on oh. soybean cyst nematode and dry beans um azukis get hit the hardest absolutely um you know kidneys and crayons probably next and and whites and blacks are probably some of the better ones um, there's certainly variety differences just because, you know, I said that Navy beans are better. doesn't mean that there's one Navy bean worse than, sure. than a kidney bean or, or vice versa. Um, it's certainly a variety thing, just like on soybeans. I would argue that, that some of the whites and black varieties are better than, or equally resistant as some resistant soybeans, um, so that they are being affected but not huge yield drags like uh, some of the other varieties or market classes can be so um we're certainly left up to rotation um i think dry beans have been run out of some areas because of high bean high soybean cyst nematode levels um i really hope we can get some of the seed treatments registered um that we have on soybeans that we can help out on the dry beans to help maybe kind of minimize it or um or maybe set it backwards, but they uh, they certainly are a host and it's certainly a concern and it's something that we need to do more research on, but there is a little bit of research going, so. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's pause on the Azukis for just a minute. Why are they so popular? Is it really just the price? Paul, tell me, what is the <laughs> mystery of the Azuki beans? The, the mystery of the Azuki beans is it's certainly a mystery. Um, working with azuki beans a long time and one year you think you have them figured out and the next year it will completely puzzle you again um it's it's a challenge for growers but it certainly is the price the price is huge this year demand is strong um we want a lot of them so the you know the price kind of dictates it for sure but uh, they're fun crop to grow the first time and you get to grow them for a couple other years after that too Volunteers can be a challenge, absolutely. That's always the biggest joke. Um, but you can control them, you know, if you do your rotation right. And and when you time your different uh, herbicides, you can really minimize it too. We have some seed growers that are growing seed soybeans again after uh, Zuki's in that field a few years previous. So it's possible to get them out. It just takes a little bit more management as Azuki seem to do all the way along the line. So. Growers, growers like them. They're a challenge, right? It, sometimes growers like a challenge. Sometimes growers don't want a challenge, but the price helps I think, that. I think we all like, yeah, I was going to say, I think we all like a challenge if we get paid for it. So then it's a lot more fun uh, when you're still making money. And, and it's the gift that keeps on giving. Let's, uh, let's, let's go that way. All right. So there's a couple of questions that have come in and these tie into the tillage question. Uh, question into the cover crop question. Uh, I want to touch on Gord Spec Snyder's first because we haven't talked a lot about fertility, but he says the recommendation is to use your best ground to avoid crusting or, but does, do edible beans also need better fertility than soys? So do they need better fertility, different fertility? Who wants to take this first? 
I hear both of you sigh. So I'm not sure. Well, they're, they're, yeah, they're going to respond to that background fertility okay. like yeah. soybeans do, right? Like. So okay. manure in the rotation, the higher organic matter fields, you know, we, we come back to the use your best farms for, for dry beans. And I think that's all part of a part of it, right? That background fertility is going to be key. So in some ways, I think they will respond more because dry edible beans respond more to most management um, decisions you make than soybeans. Mm -hmm. Soybeans kind of do their own thing, right? So they're tough. They're not tough, but you don't need to manage soybeans like you need to do dry beans. So I would say background fertility um, is going to help dry beans out more than soybeans. Okay, Dennis, agree, disagree? Um, well, it's interesting. Um, and for soybeans, for sure, you know, they're good scavengers for phosphate. Um, you know, your nitrogen basically is taken care of through through inoculation. Um, you know, the kind of the rule of thumb in dry beans and mantle, we've been following the North Dakota recommendation for years is, you know, for nitrogen, you, you need to have about 100 pounds of nitrogen available to produce a 2,000 pound crop. That's been the recommendation for years. So some recent uh, research that's been done by Krista McMillan over the last number of years has actually shown something a little bit different. Um, they're not showing, um, or she wasn't showing any nitrogen response to on dry beans until you got up to that 140 pounds of nitrogen. So between zero and 139 pounds, there really wasn't any um, response now that's interesting to me because you know that kind of goes against what we've been kind of um, promoting over the years or, or talking about over the years. Um, that research was done in drier years, but it begs the question: Is you know is there background nodulation happening in dry beans now that we've been growing it more often that that's taking you know that's taking over a little bit? I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's an interesting question. Um, Fertility-wise, generally though, you, know, you want to have good. Um, uh, P and K levels in your in your soil. Um, you want to and, and typically growers are looking at you know lighter soil, sandier soils for growing dry beans now. They don't want those heavy clays anymore because they can put the soybeans on there. So it is a, a lot more easier to manage on those soils. Um, but um, it, again, I'll just say this: anybody can be a, a a soybean grower, but it takes real skill to be a dry bean grower. So we'll say that. <laughs> I like that. That's a good quote. All right. So there's also a question that's come in. So, of course, because we, we are concerned about crusting, um, soil structure, of course, is going to come into play, organic matter, all of these sorts of uh, things that we have to manage. So let's talk tillage. We're going to talk row width when we talk, I think, about white mold maybe a bit more. Um, but, Paul, from your perspective, what would you say is the more typical uh, sort of tillage setup for dry beans? Or is there a typical I honestly, I don't think there is a typical anymore, right? Historically, right. it's been plow in the fall, plow your corn stalks under, come back in the spring, cultivate, 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 um, and plant, and you got bare soil. Anymore, man, like it's everything from strip till to planting green to uh, fall disking vertical till to kind of get the corn stalks under control. Um, it's kind of everything now and and they they can fit into these different scenarios certainly white beans and black beans i've seen them no till i think most of the time you want some sort of tillage there just to kind of you know break up the corn root balls and things like that it's going to depend on your your row width certainly um you know is there a standard row width i would say maybe 15 inch rows just because people are using a drill to plant them but so many, you know, once you get into the larger seeded beans where you're pulling them, you're going to be in a 30 inch row or 22 inch row to have whatever your pulling equipment is set up to. And, you know, again, it's, you know, you want to see a planter used versus a drill um, because you're going lower populations. The seed's more valuable. You got to, you know, precision plant as much as you can with the equipment you have. But there, there's lots of different ways for tillage um, and cover crops and strip tills and all those sorts of things. So it's kind of the mixed bag anymore, I would say. Okay, I'm just gonna put it out there, everyone. I didn't realize that beans were pulled before harvest until I was like in my 30s, like well into my 30s. Um, and so I'm just showing my prairie when that happens. But Paul, can you please explain to the kids at home because I was surprised by this. Which beans do we pull and what do we mean by that? What does that look like? 
it 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 doesn't lots of beans can be pulled it's more what market class they're going to go into um so the easiest one to say we want pulled would be dark red kidney beans any bean where crack seed coats is going to be your major grading factor versus color or or anything else um you're going to pull a bean so it can go through an edible bean a specialty bean combine so a picket a bob a lilliston a modest you know i'm sure there's some other ones out there too but those are the main ones are the our pickets are now and typically you're going to go through and pull the beans before you you harvest them so here in ontario we're going to pull them early in the morning like before the sun comes up a lot of time um, and then you're going to combine that afternoon with a with a pull type edible bean combine and, and it's for crack seed goats so okay. sometimes otibos get clipped um, sometimes they get pulled um, but kidney beans, for the most part, are going to get pulled and through the edible bean combine for crack seed coats. I feel like the longer the show goes on, the more kinds of beans we learn about. So I just feel like now you can make up names. Okay, so dentists, um, we don't yes. pull beans in Manitoba, right? Um, we pull and we undercut. So th to me, there's a bit of a distinction, right? When you're okay. pulling beans, you're using a, a system that pulls the entire plant, root and all, right? Um, usually that's kind of reserved for the lighter soil, sandier soil is kind of the pick at one step that will basically pull the entire plant using a rod weeder type system. Um, undercutting is a little different. Undercutting, you run these knives under the, just under the soil surface. You're cutting the roots. You want to leave the roots in the ground. You want to leave the plants on top. So in our cases, uh, kidneys, for example, growers will cut their kidneys probably a week or so before uh, harvest. They want to keep that coloration of the seed. They don't want the sun burning. Whereas if you wait too long, sometimes you get sunburning on one side of the seat. Now, clipping, uh, another term is straight cutting or flex heading for, is what we would use here. Uh, we're seeing more and more of that happen every year. Um, typically, navies, pintos, and blacks are your more common ones that you would uh, use a flex header on. But I've seen guys, growers that use um, things with uh, kidneys and, and, and crans. I wouldn't recommend it because there's a lot of things that can go wrong in a hurry and you can lose a lot of money. So I typically recommend growers do their undercutting or, you know, in this case, pulling if they, if they have such, if they have that equipment and you, but really for those specialty bean types, you need to run, you know, the specialty combines for that because that, you know, your traditional combine, even with modifications will work on years when you have, you know, good seed moisture, um, you know, dry, dry plants, everything's in your favor. They don't work though when your seed moisture is high and you've got green plant material and you're staining your beans and, and there's all whole, uh, a whole um, a slew of things that can go wrong in a hurry. So for growers growing navies, pencils, blacks, yeah, go ahead and use your conventional machines. Anybody using the specialty beans, kidneys, crans, um, um, small reds, uh, pink beans, all those big acres that we have of those in Manitoba, this is, that's going out to you, Jason, uh, based on your comments. Um, yeah, you can you can just kind of pick and choose which machines will work best for you. Okay, so a hot topic, of course, Paul, right now, cover crops uh, certainly getting a lot of acreage over the past couple of years. Uh, do they fit in the edible bean system or do they cause more problems than they fix? What's uh, how do we navigate that? <laughs> Yeah, like I, I think it's, it's, you know, I'm going to cop out and say it's a mixed bag again. But yeah, I, I, I've seen planting live into rye, crimping the rye down. Um, the grower that did that, um, I had the pleasure of walking those fields. Um, yeah, slugs, slugs are going to be a problem in there. Um, you know, his comment certainly was they were the cleanest white beans he'd ever harvested. Um, because there was just no dust splash up onto the plant. So, you know, everywhere along the line, there's just no dirt because um, it was it was awesome that way. But your plant stand is greatly reduced and, you know, you really got to know what you're doing. So much easier on soybeans. All these things are than dry beans. Dry beans are a little bit finickier. Take that more management, um, take a little bit of skill, certainly, but it, it, it can work. Absolutely. Okay. All right. I, I want to pause for a moment because I, I want to send a shout out to uh, our show sponsors tonight. We're not going to get to the last clip, but uh, after we hear from our sponsors, I do want to talk white mold. So Jay, if you can, uh, that shout out to our show sponsors. 
our sponsors of The Agronomist are Adama Canada, The Edible Bean School, and Canola Master. We call ourselves Canola Master because we want every canola grower to achieve growing perfection. Master your canola with the 160 Acres of Gold giveaway. Enter today at canolamaster.ca. Conditions apply. love that little ditty okay uh warren schneckenberger our guest last week showing up late but better late than never uh so welcome here and um yes uh today if anyone listened to real egg radio today with peter johnson and uh host sean haney they do dig into some of the results on the cover crops not all rosy definitely lots to think about there um okay but let's dig into because there's still so much to cover on this topic and we we don't have a lot of time left but there's a few last things i want to hit on so dennis so, so i'll start with you white molds so this is white mold is the same as sclerotinia in canola it also affects sunflowers it obviously affects the beans we got soybeans. How in the heck, and I'll use heck, do we manage for this in Manitoba with that many host crops in rotation? Well, it's it's not just the host crops, but it, it's the conditions at time of application of fungicide that we really need to look at, right? Um, you know, I usually try to run through a checklist with growers and I say, well, question number one, what bean type you're growing? Um, if it's if it's a type that's susceptible, like let's say you're growing a pinto, for example, and then along with that, that you have let's say uh, you know a 30 inch row spacing. Well, 30 inch row spacing would mean you have a lot of space. However, if you have a year with lots of moisture and, and a little cooler, a little cooler se- uh, season in that 20 to 22 degree temperatures and lots of growth, then you're a little bit more susceptible to to uh, white mold. So I try to treat it as a field by field basis for growers. Um, we have a, a number of years, like in 17, 18, and 19, we had very little white mold pressure because the summer was really dry. And growers were calling me and say, well, should I spray? Well, you run through this checklist and you're finding there's lots of air movement in the canopy. There's not, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, there's not a lot of um, uh, plant material kind of uh, for that environment to develop. So in those cases, growers elect not to spray. Now, that's a different environment than what we see in Ontario. Um, but in Manitoba here, um, rotation is part of it, but I think uh, the, the larger part of it is uh, has just to do with uh, conditions that we have during the season and, and making those right decisions and making the right choice of fungicide based on those conditions. All right, Paul. Um, I mean, similar challenge as far as, you know, other host crops grow nearby on the same fields, maybe, maybe not, um, but definitely humidity. A lot of and lot of water and humidity. So how big of an issue is white mold in the driving crop? Um, huge, um, certainly the number one pest. Um, you know, the, the clip you had from, from Chris there really says it best, you know, you can go from a, you know, zero, which is low to no infection to 70% yield loss with a 50% infection. And arguably I'm gonna say, you know, when I'm working with growers here, we're gonna say, you are spraying for white mold um, because right now I can tell you if it's in this field, you've had mold there in the past. Like I can, let's make the call to spray white mold now. And if we end up with four weeks of dry weather during flowering, then we'll say not spray. But for budgeting purposes, for planning purposes, for all the purposes you want, we are going to spray for mold in Ontario on dry beans. These beans are worth 50, 60, 90 cents a pound. How can you talk yourself out of a $50 an acre spray? Like, don't do it, just spray. So now that's that's for, let's say once, how often do we get into multiple passes? Yeah, for sure, we're gonna spray once. So then again, for budgeting purposes, you're gonna budget in two sprays. And if it doesn't rain between the first and the second, or there's no rain in the forecast, pull your second spray out. Maybe just, you know, sprayer fatigue sets in at that time of year. And I guess that's why I, we started with the quality problems. Right. Your insecticide at that timing is probably your most important insecticide spray. And if we're not driving through the field to put on a fungicide, then growers forget to spray the insecticide. And tarnished plant bug and western bean cutworm are 
robbing us blind out there and destroying our quality. So uh, don't get caught in the sprayer fatigue trap. Okay. So this is, so first of all, Tarnished Plant Bug, great name. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but Western Bean Catworm, of course, we talk about a lot. We always think about like from the corn perspective, but mm -hmm. has an impact on the beans as well. Yes, absolutely. So if Jay can pull up my pictures there of uh, pull up of uh, Western bean cutworm damage. So at the grower level, you may not necessarily see this in your sample so much. Um, next picture, Jay, that's tarnished plant bug in a soaked sample of beans. So the brown spots really show. But the Western bean cutworm, it is a next picture, Jay. It is a tricky, tricky pest because you can rarely next picture sorry you can rarely see it in the crop so here in ontario we're going to use the trap network on the western bean cutworms and follow what's going on in the corn crop to um, look at peak trap counts for western bean cutworms and then judge our sprays of insecticides in the dry bean crop from that i would make a strong argument that the large seeded beans um the, Jay, there should be one there called Western Bean Cutworm Damage or something. Oh, he's he may not be able to find it. Oh, he says don't don't have it. Um, okay. So we will imagine that it's there. Okay. Okay. So yeah. maybe Jay, go back to the tarnish bug uh, one yeah. just because as an example, because you said this is these are soaked. So this these is a soaked. reason we see that damage. But what if these yeah. hadn't been soaked? Would we see? those brown spots like that? Um, probably not. Um, because in, so this is a white bean or actually a great Northern, I think, but the white beans and, and it, if the skin is the same color as the bean underneath, you won't see it because it's just white on white. But as soon as you soak it, it comes out brown. Or as soon as you cook it, it comes out these brown spots, which nobody wants to eat. Um, Western big cutworm, just like, it's like a, like it's a little tiny worm, but it, it takes a big monster bite out of the beans. So half the bean will be missing and, uh, or the ends of the bean. And, and they're so impossibly hard to try and scout um, in the field, even with grad students sleeping in test plots overnight, they can't find these Western bean cutworms. Like they're easy to find in corn in comparison. And um, yeah. it's, it's, it, they're, they're impossible to scout for. So you just, we have, we basically everything on maps yeah because in corn you're actually looking for the egg masses right like you're right. that's what you're looking for which those are hard enough to find in yep. you know five foot tall corn um great question or so so jason says we call tarnished plant bug ligus bugs so they're are they really the same thing i had no idea i am learning so much tonight this is amazing uh question though to dennis and jason says not confirmed so dennis uh, if you can do we have western bean cutworm in manitoba Western bean cutworm, no, but ligus bug we okay. do from time to time. Yes. Which is tarnished plant. Uh, uh, ligus bug has it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, from time to time, we've seen it in navy beans. Um, going back a number of years, uh, one of my previous companies we worked for, um, we had an issue uh, with it, and it actually spawned a research project from the University of Manitoba after that. And they could never get the numbers again after that. The very first year, it was really bad to the point that we – um, uh, we were seeing three, four, five percent uh, insect damage, um, but we could never find it on a consistent basis um, in Manitoba. So we're pretty fortunate. We don't have Western bean cutworm. We have set up traps over the years to try to find that. We have not been able to, which is we're fortunate for that. Mm -hmm. So our insect pressure is very minimal in Manitoba. Okay, so in fairness, though, everyone, before you get really jealous of Western Canada, there are like a hundred different things that attack canola. So <laughs> it's just for this particular crop and for corn that we just, that's one pest we don't have, okay? Um, all right, uh, Peter asks, what percent of edibles are sprayed for Western bean cutworm? Paul, do you have a, a guess? Um, not enough is going to be my guess. Um, I, I, especially on the big beans, right? Like, the big beans, you have so many fewer beans out there. So every one that the Western bean cutworm takes a chomp out of um, is money out of your pocket. So um, each individual bean is worth that much more in a kidney bean crop versus a, a white bean crop. So 
Um, in a white bean crop, I think the beans, by the time they take their chomp out of the bean, you have more beans get cleaned out as dockage. So then it's not as much of a concern. Um, the bigger concern is the ones that only have, you know, a quarter of the bean missing. Um, and then it ends up as pick. So then it's your double hit on your, uh, on your grade mm -hmm. is pick. So I, 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 I would, if I had a guess, Sorry. I would say under 20%, but I, I think okay. it, needs to it be probably higher. should be higher. Yeah. Is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sean Haney, who some of you also may know um, from Real Ag Radio and Real Agriculture fame, asked a question about storage BMPs, about storage best management practices. So now storage in Ontario, we know is largely handled by very large elevators and off it goes. Dennis, are farmers for the most part in Manitoba also pretty quickly sending off their dry beans or is there quite a bit of storage that's happening? In Western Canada or in Manitoba specifically, because there is a lot more on-farm storage. Yeah, so in I, I guess the bean companies typically uh, would like to see their you know all their contracts come in in the fall. Um, they're, they're over the years they're having growers at store and they have to be set up accordingly. Um, I think some of the things that you really need to look at you need to look at bin hopper bins. You need to look at bins with bean ladders in them. You need to look at bins with um, aeration for sure. I think one of the one of the things that some growers forget is that um, they put their, these beans in at a warm temperatures and they forgot to turn the air on. And then all of a sudden now you have a little bit of crusting issues on top. Um, um, most growers, if they're storing, they're storing in hopper bins. Nobody, nobody stores flat bins on farm. Nobody stores uh, Quonset storage at grower level on farm. The bean companies do, but then they have to monitor it differently. So, um, and, and I think probably the biggest thing is just to make sure that you know, if you are storing beans on farm, um, pull a load out before winter comes just to make sure there's no crust issues, um, crusting issues. But before you do that, climb to the top of the bin using your safety gear and make sure that uh, you there is no crust that forms on the top before you do that. Just because if there is and you pull it through the bin, you can really uh, hurt your quality. So. Mm hmm. And, and Paul, so one of the things we talked about tonight for sure is that seed damage that's going to happen, that exactly that is going to come out as pick or it's it's going to end up impacting quality quite a bit. Um, is there something farmers or what are the things farmers can be doing at harvest that can really impact seed quality uh, sort of when they go to deliver? <laughs> um, combine settings. Um, it's going to be a big one. Harvest conditions, um, it, you know, is is huge as well. So um, a pick grading factor typically is going to be environmental conditions. So whether that's um, seed is too uh, green going into the combine, uh, weed seeds gumming up and then putting dirt and stains onto the beans themselves. So that's going to affect your pick. And those are mainly environmental. Um, da uh, dockage is mainly going to come out of your combine. Um, so whether it's pods, broken beans, uh, weed seeds, that sort of thing. So combine settings and environmental conditions are huge. When we have a great fall, like we've had this past year, quality is awesome. Um, environmental conditions are, are very, very low. So it's all about combine settings and condition, field conditions and uh, getting the beans through the combine in one piece without uh, damaging them. So low low speeds on your on your rotors and unload augers and things like that so take it easy um quick question what so the pick gets fed to livestock i'm assuming what likes to eat beans it doesn't dennis where does it go what do you do with it um, Rush? what happens what do you do with I gotta it know. well let's let's just say sometimes that pick stays in storage for a long time before you can move it um that's why there's that's why there's discounts in place um but we, really we, it's pick is anything that can oh go ahead no oh, I, I was just gonna say we we have the advantage of we do have feed mills like within yeah. our system so we can yeah. we actually roast most of our calls okay. and uh yeah. put them into the livestock feed that way but they they do have to be cooked yeah. somewhere they do the have to be cooked. Yeah. just like humans so to get the most nutrition out of yeah. them but yeah yeah, we just don't do that in Manitoba because there's not enough of that supply for the for the feed markets. They're using other feed sources. Um, yeah. Over the years, we've tried to we've had guys that have tried to roast them. Um, you have to be a little careful with that because if you're roasting just 
pick, that's fine. But if you got all the other chaff in there, it can be a little bit more prone to fire. So that's just different markets. But generally, we always have a tougher time moving the stuff in Manitoba, like that really low quality stuff. So I feel like dry beans are like, if you're looking for a thrill, this is the crop to grow. Like it's a management yeah. challenge. The pick can catch fire. Like it's just endless excitement. <laughs> I mean, really. Well, all right. Okay. No, I like I, it. Yeah, go I'd ahead. Like to add. Yeah, um, just uh, one thing uh, with growers harvesting beans, I always try to encourage growers to check the sample on the back of the truck. Don't just check what comes in the combine hopper because a lot of times it looks okay in the hopper, but then there's, if you're just using a conventional auger on your combine to unload, you get that smearing action. And I've had calls from growers and saying, wow, I've checked my sample, it's all good. And then all of a sudden that load comes back or the grade comes back from the bean plant and it's high pick. Well, the auger, the unload augers were smearing the beans because there was moisture and dirt mm -hmm. in there and they didn't realize that. So it's always good to check what goes in the back of the uh, back of the truck. So, Okay, that's great advice. Okay, this has been absolutely, I have learned so many things about edible beans. Kevin had to sign off early. I'm going to send him a link to this because he can't miss this last part of it. Um, not that I think the Fraser Valley is going to be growing edible beans anytime <laughs> soon. But the more you know, we need a little rainbow, Jay, uh, the more you know. All right, Paul and Dennis, thank you so much uh, for this evening. This has been so much fun and really informative. Um, so I thank you both for taking the time. I know uh, it's a busy time of year, so I do appreciate it. Um, I did want to, of course, say thank you to our show sponsors, to Adama Canada, to Canola Master, and to the Edible Bean School. So if uh, you're looking for more information, head on over to realagriculture.com uh, slash Edible Bean School for more. Um, and next week, this is super exciting. Everyone, tell your friends, um, invite them. Uh, we are going to do a top five agronomy stories of 2022 uh, next week for The Agronomist. And it will be our last one for the year. We'll be back uh, in the new year. We're going to take a couple weeks off for the holidays. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm super excited about next week as well. And of course, quick reminder, head to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow to get those CU credits. Rob Miller finally jumps in. I can't believe you didn't have a question. Hi, Rob. Thanks. Um, and uh, yes, Peter Johnson, safe travels tomorrow. Dennis, uh, give him a high five for me tomorrow when you see him. All right, Paul, Dennis, thank you so much. Have a great night, everybody. Cheers.